Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Lorraine Godwin. I'm the Regional Business Manager for Geosoft's North American office. And today's webinar will focus on how to exploit the potential of gravity and magnetic data. The objective of the webinar is to show you how you can effectively improve your exploration success and increase the confidence in your geologic models by knowing how and when to use your gravity and magnetic data to further leverage your seismic data and hopefully help you improve your depth models and define or constrain geometry in geologically challenging areas. I would now like to introduce you to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Mikhail Ad Ellen Ruder. Mikhail is a longtime client of Geosoft, and we invited her to be our speaker today because of her extensive experience and background in gravity and magnetics. Her credentials include a joint degree in geology and physics from Bowdoin College, and a PhD in geophysics from the Pennsylvania State University. Her diverse work experience spans across government, academia, and industrial research and exploration labs with reputable organizations such as NASA and Exxon Production Research Company with the primary focus on analyzing, interpreting, and integrating gravity and magnetic data with seismic data. In 1996, Macau founded her own company called Winter Moon Geotechnologies where she serves as president and chief geophysicist. Winter Moon specializes in integrated analysis of geophysical and GIS data for exploration purposes. Please join me in welcoming Mikhail Ruder. Lorraine, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, be here and to be able to participate in this presentation. So welcome, everybody. Uh, you can hear me, but obviously I cannot hear you. Um, Today we'll be talking about uh, gravity and magnetics for ex exploration, and uh, as you can tell from the title, when seismic is not enough, it sounds a little bit like a geophysical soap opera, so uh, uh, that's a bit of humor there, but uh, really we find that it's um, helpful and even important to use gravity and mag um, because seismic is not the uh, perfect imaging tool in all geologic uh, scenarios, so we're going to... Uh, talk about those and uh, we'll go through some of the background of, for example, what is a gravity anomaly. Uh, we'll show you numerous uh, gravity application case, case histories. Then we'll swing over to mag magnetics, talk about magnetic anomalies and compare them with gravity, see how they are similar and uh, some of their important differences too. Uh, again, talking about magnetics role in exploration and showing you some application case histories. All right. Um, gravity and magnetics, also known as potential fields, have traditionally been used as frontier exploration tools. As data quality has improved and our ability to acquire data more rapidly and uh, less expensively, uh, we've seen that gravity and magnetics have now been able to be used for uh, prospecting uh, problems also. Uh, traditionally, grab and mag are considered to be low resolution techniques, and, and that is obviously still the case, especially when compared with seismic data. On the other hand, though, seismic has some important and significant drawbacks, one of which is that acquisition is very expensive. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, seismic is not necessarily a perfect tool uh, in all geologic settings. It has particularly poor signal-to-noise ratio in um, areas where we have uh, vertical discontinuities, for example, faults, salt diapirs, shell diapirs. Uh, also in other areas where we have challenging acoustical properties and uh, earth materials that are known for this uh, include salt, uh, high-velocity high carbonates, um, tombstone, if you will, that uh, dolomite that uh, tends to be sort of a seismic sink. Uh, and, of course, vol volcanics. In addition, seismic can have some uh, data quality issues when uh, we have near-surface low-velocity zones and also velocity in inversions. Fortunately, um, well, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, how gravity and magnetics can have a positive impact, um, gravity and mag, um, uh, unlike seismic, which uh, tends to be fairly uh, well organized in terms of the signal that comes back to you soonest is coming from the shallowest horizons, gravity and magnetic signatures image all uh, 
gravity and magnetic anomalies at all depths at, 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 at all times. And this um, tends to uh, lead to a bit of uh, challenge in terms of the interpretation of gravity and mag data in that we're looking at the full uh, crustal signal for density in the case of gravity and ion content um, in the case of mag magnetics all at the same time. Nonetheless, uh, we have a lot of really helpful techniques that we have developed which um, allow us to interpret gravity and mag data to identify the uh, location of and to map the shape of uh, sedimentary basins. And in uh, the super frontier areas, this becomes a really important product that we can derive from gravity and mag data. Uh, also, gravity and mag data allow us to high grade targets so that we can um, devote our seismic dollars, um, our more expensive ex exploration techniques, um, in areas which are more promising for uh, ex exploration purposes. So again, we use grav and mag, which are low cost and uh, relatively low resolution, to help us target areas for uh, more expensive 2D and 3D seismic acquisition. Now, as we mentioned earlier, gravity and magnetics um, are uh, uh, certainly considered to be, uh, if you will, uh, poor cousins or secondary tools compared with our favorite geophysical technique called seismic. Um, and it's important to recognize that gravity and magnetics um, will not help you in every geologic uh, scenario. Um, so, what we the areas where Geologic settings where gravity and mag won't necessarily give you much insight would include areas where we have well-behaved layer cake geology. The reason why gravity and magnetics won't give you any uh, further insight into this type of a geologic scenario is that there's no lateral contrast of either density or magnetic susceptibility. Magnetic susceptibility is uh, really a measure of the volume percent of magnetite in a rock. Um, so again, um, the reason why grab and mag won't work in a well-behaved area, in a well-behaved layer cake area, is because there's no lateral contrast in density or magnetic susceptibility. That's a really critical point here. Fortunately, in an area where we do have this uh, flat-lying layer cake structure, acoustic energy is usually easily transmitted and reflected, so the seismic data quality is usually quite good. Um, here's a and example of what we're talking about. This is a quick 2D model. Um, we have uh, in the lower window an earth model and we're showing you flatline layer cake geology with increasing density as a function of depth. Again, there's no lateral density contrast here. There's no faulting, there's no folding. And as a result, the um, measured gravity anomaly here uh, is zero. There is no anomaly at all because there's no lateral density contrast. Uh, just for scale, we're looking um, at an area that uh, is from sea level to 8 kilometers in depth and uh, 0 to 70 kilometers across. Our units of measure are in milligals, and uh, we're looking at a 20 milligal dy dynamic range here. Now, in contrast, where gravity and magnetics will help, uh, where we have lateral discontinuities, where we have faulting. Um, the reason why gravity and magnetics will work in this area is that there is going to be a significant lateral contrast of density or magnetic susceptibility. Um, typically, not all the time, but often where we do have these lateral discontinuities and faults and diapers, things like that, acoustic energy is very poorly transmitted. Um, lith lithologies, which are uh, typical of this kind of a scenario, would be salt, high velocity carbonates, volcanics. Often it's very difficult to um, uh, penetrate seismic energy below these types of earth materials and then we wind up essentially being seismically blind below these uh, horizons. This is where gravity and magnetics can help a lot. Um, another uh, typical scenario where gravity and mag helps a lot is identification of volcanics in the sedimentary section. Um, Typically, vo volcanics are uh, high density and have a lot of magnetite in them, so they will give rise to a lateral contrast in density and magnetic susceptibility. As a result, we'll have a significant gravity and magnetic anomaly. And of course, going back to our uh, 
traditional super frontier applications, looking at total sediment thickness of basins, um, identification of the basin depot center, again, you getting back to that uh, shape of the con container question. And finally, uh, as identification uh, of structural trends, faults, liniments, basement uh, features, basement character, basement fabric, if you will. Um, and this is, uh, these are the typical uh, tr traditional um, applications for gravity and night. And here's a case of uh, how a, a lateral density contrast would actually work, giving us a measurable gravity anomaly. Uh, again, we've taken our layer cake geology and we've um, uh, inserted a normal fault and we've um, pushed up the uh, eastern side of the model here. So now we're actually looking at a, a lateral density contrast, 2.1 against 1.9 in this zone, 2.3 against 2.1. 2.35 versus 2.3, 2.45 against 2.35, and finally 2.5 versus 2.45. So in many areas here, we're looking at a, a, a lateral density contrast. Um, this has 500 meters of throw along this fault, and we're actually producing a 10 milligal anomaly. This is well within the resolution um, limits of uh, a gravity survey that's done on land, a gravity survey that's done by ship, um, which would typically be done in tandem with 2D or 3D seismic acquisition, and even a gravity survey done from the air, either in a helicopter or in a fixed-wing aircraft. Now, I also want to note here that the uh, positive anomaly is over the denser portion of the model. So, uh, on the upthrown uh, part of the, uh, on the, on the upthrown block from the normal fault, we have a positive gravity anomaly, and on the downthrown uh, portion of the fault, we have a relative negative anomaly. Note that the maximum rate of change, the steepest gradient in the gravity field, is directly over the fault itself. These are really fundamental um, uh, observations to keep in mind when you look at a gravity map, and when you see a positive anomaly, you know you sit, you're sitting on top of relatively dense rock, compared to everything around it. Again, you must have that lateral density contrast to give rise to a gravity anomaly. And the steepest portion of the uh, gradient, or the fastest rate of change, typically lies directly over the um, edge of the uh, dense rock, if you will. Now, part of the reason why gravity works so well um, as, a, uh, as a mapping tool of Earth properties is that uh, the density of Earth materials is a very well-behaved uh, physical property. Density is a bulk rock property, and densities of typical lithologies are fairly pre predictable. Um, this is a chart from Dobrin and Savitt, and you can see that we're going from salt in, into sandstone, shale, limestone, and then uh, igneous and met metamorphic rocks. On average, uh, the sedimentary rocks are less dense than the igneous and the metamorphic rocks. You see, however, there's a great range, obviously, in the laboratory measured bulk, bulk densities of these, of these rocks. Interestingly, salt is a, fairly, is a very well-behaved, very hom homogeneous uh, earth material and has a density of 2.17, whether it's up at the surface or down at 30,000 feet or 10 kilometers. Um, it's really the only earth material that behaves in that, in that fashion. Other sedimentary rocks, sandstone, shell, limestone, um, as they are subjected to more overpressure, they, their densities typically in, increase, uh, over, overburden pressure, I should say. Um, but in general, the salt will be at a relatively constant density at any depth. The sandstone in the vicinity of, say, 2.2 to 2.35, uh, shells slightly denser, limestones even 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 more dense. Um, the uh, uh, felsic igneous rocks in the vicinity of 2.6 to 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter, and then mafic igneous rocks typically uh, 2.75 and higher. Um, dolomite, of course, uh, a bit more dense than typical limestone. All right, let's have a look at an example here, looking at um, a gravity anomaly, uh, trying to understand the um, volume of salt that 
might be present. Again, going back to our uh, case, uh, to, to our uh, laboratory measurements, we remember that salt is significantly less dense than almost uh, any other uh, typical uh, earth material that we would find in, in, in a sedimentary basin. All right, here's a theoretical model of a salt, of, of a salt diapir. This is a very non-geologic looking salt diapir, so I apologize for that. Um, we're looking at uh, sea level down to 8 kilometers depth and a 60 kilometer wide model. So uh, um, we've got uh, layer cake geology intruded by this salt diapir. So we have lateral density contrasts uh, of 2.17 versus 2.3 versus 2.35 versus 2.45. Interestingly, the salt is actually a little bit more dense than the uh, very shallow sedimentary rock here. Nonetheless, we have an overall negative anomaly uh, that is associated with the salt diapir. So let's have a look at some real-world data. Uh, this is a Bouguer gravity anomaly map um, where we're looking at uh, a uh, color code here where we have positive gravity anomalies shown in red and the most negative gravity anomalies are shown in blue. Interestingly, throughout the area we see um, uh, a series of relative negative gravity anomalies that cut through this general positive in here. We see again this broad red purplish area as the area where we have the, uh, the most dense rocks in the Earth's crust. So, however, it's not of uniform density everywhere. Recall our earlier model that where we have gradients, we're actually uh, coming off of uh, very high density rocks into some less dense rocks and then going back into more high density rocks. Now, we know a bit about this area. Uh, we've um, studied seismic data in this area and I'll now show you a seismic profile that cuts from west to east through this, through this area, cutting through some of these positive anomalies and these local relative negative anomalies. Let's see what we can understand from that. Uh, here is the uh, seismic line with um, some in, in, interpretation on it. Now, we do know that this is a salt-bearing basin, so the first thing that we're thinking about uh, with some of these anticlines is that these are salt-cored anticlines. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, observed gravity shown here as the series of dark uh, black dots here. We see some local negative anomalies, and these seem to be correlating with where we have the possibility of our salt cord anticlines. Um, when we assign densities to these overlying uh, sedimentary horizons, we see that our uh, initial gravity interpretation is certainly not matching the observed data. Let's look at the same model now color coded as a function of density. You see we have light rocks uh, above our uh, very, very dense uh, dolomite uh, located here in orange, and then below the dolomite we've got our salt diapirs. The gravity response of the geometries and the densities that we've got here uh, is shown again as this thin solid line here. Not a good fit. So let's modify the model and see what we get. We're first going to work on the eastern salt wall. Let's go ahead and add a bunch of salt here, again based on the seismic uh, data quality and character, we think that we might be seeing a lot of shallow salt. Well, this certainly is looking much better in terms of the fit of the computed gravity re response to the observed. Now let's turn our attention to the central salt wall. Let's add a bit more salt there. Well, now with all of this salt, and we've even filled in some of this, it looks like we're uh, maybe over overshooting a bit. So let's keep on making adjustments here. We'll keep changing things around. We're going to keep the western salt wall as it is. Now we're going to add a little bit more detail, put in um, a salt overhang uh, in our central wall. Again, we can keep iterating on this model un uh, until we get a better fit. Part of the reason why we need to know the total volume of salt is that we're, as you recall from the earlier seismic image, the data quality in the, in the seismic data below the salt is pretty much non-existent. If we can use the gravity to help to get 
the total geometry of the salt right, maybe we can reprocess the seismic data using improved velocities to get a better image of the subsalt, which is, of course, where our prospect happens to lie. Now, another important thing there is once we get all of these uh, salt uh, geometries right, again, we can figure out what the base of the salt looks like more accurately and then hopefully improve our seismic data quality. This is an important result because ultimately we can use a gravity-constrained Earth model to improve our seismic velocity model. That in turn will give us improved ray tracing, improved pre-stack depth migration volumes, and a higher confidence in the seismic image in depth. Any salt-bearing basin anywhere in the world, whether it's the Gulf of Mexico, um, offshore Brazil, offshore West Africa, or other areas, um, we've been using gravity to help improve seismic data quality now for 20 years, which is awesome. All right, let's talk a little bit about different types of gravity anomaly maps. When we were looking at that pretty map that uh, had colors ranging from purple to red on into blue, we called that a DJ gravity anomaly map. Um, you'll hear uh, these terms uh, bantered about by your um, gravity acquisition uh, con contractors, free air gravity, bouguet gravity, isostatic, residual. The free air gravity is the uh, most basic processing that we do to gravity data. It contains uh, the gravity signatures and the gravity anomalies due to lateral density contrasts everywhere within the Earth's crust, all the way down to the mantle and then below. Uh, one of the challenges in working with free air gravity data, however, is that uh, uh, it's extremely sensitive to topographic relief onshore and also to uh, bathymetry offshore. The reason for that, of course, is that the lateral density contrast onshore between air and solid Earth is very high. And that's the first uh, density contrast that the free air gravity sees, so it images that to, the, to uh, a very large extent. And then superimposed on that, we see lateral density contrast from deeper uh, uh, geologic features. Similarly, with the offshore, the first important lateral density contrast that we see is the contrast between seawater and the mudline, or the mud below the bathymetry. So that, of course, is the dominant signature that we see in free air gravity offshore. It, buried in the free air data, as I said, is the information about lateral density contrast below the bathymetric surface and below the topographic surface onshore, but it's hard to recognize. So we do a correction. We call that the bouguet correction. I apologize. There's a typo on this. So that should be B-O-U-G-U-E-R. My apologies. Um, it was named after uh, a French geodesist, Pierre Bouguet, FYI. <laughs> um, the advantage of the Bouguet gravity correction is that we minimize the effect of the density contrast between air and topography onshore and also between water and the bathymetric surface offshore. By removing or minimizing this uh, gravity anomaly due to topography or bathymetry, we now enhance our ability to image the lateral density contrast in the Earth's crust below the topographic surface and below the bathymetric surface. The Bouguet gravity uh, map is best uh, used for map-based in interpretation. So when you guys uh, have a gravity uh, survey done and your contractor delivers to you the free air gravity map and the Bouguet gravity map or the Bouguet anomaly gravity map for your purposes of mapping lateral density contrast below the bat below the symmetry or below the topography, I would suggest that you uh, work off of the Bouguet gravity anomaly grid. Then finally, your uh, your acquisition contractor may go uh, even further and uh, calculate for you an isostatic residual. This is uh, taking out the effect not only of, of the topography onshore and the, and the bathymetry off, offshore, but also it removes the effect of any changes in crustal thickness. Believe it or not, as uh, the isostatic uh, response of the Earth's crust as uh, we need thicker crust to hold up our highly mountainous 
regions and we have thinner crusts under oceanic crust for uh, thinner crust in the region of oceanic crust, for example, because it's more dense. Um, and also the, uh, the symmetry is deep. These uh, effects give, give rise to long wavelength gravity anomalies. The, uh, these long wavelength gravity anomalies, which reflect changes in crustal thickness, are present in the Bouguer gravity anomaly grid. So when you look at a Bouguer gravity anomaly grid of, a, of an entire continent, you'll see long wavelength gravity signatures coming from areas where we have relatively thick crust, where the dense mantle is deeper, will have a negative anomaly. Where the dense mantle is more shallow, will have a positive anomaly. So as, uh, as you can imagine, when we look at uh, continent-wide gravity maps, we are often not that interested in mapping the uh, thickness of the crust. We're more interested in mapping uh, anomalies which are uh, associated with uh, uh, lateral density contrast within the crust, which are associated with exploration uh, geologic targets. So it's nice for us to remove the effect of the uh, crustal thickness changes. This is what the isostatic residual does. Let's look at a couple of continent-wide gravity anomaly maps now. This is the Bouguer gravity anomaly map for the conterminous United States. Uh, in that, in as much as it's blue game, we know that the effect of topographic relief has largely been removed. So uh, when we look at the Rocky Mountains, we don't see a bunch of positive anomalies uh, associated with topographic relief. In fact, we can see a broad negative anomaly, which is due to the fact that we have extra thick crust underlying our Rocky Mountains. So our dense mantle is further away from the gravity meter. So we have light crust, which is extra thick, giving us uh, a local negative anomaly, which is quite broad over the entire western United States. Moving away from there, we see a very interesting pattern of local uh, positive anomalies and negative, and negative anomalies, as well as uh, signatures of things like uh, ancient triple, triple junctions. So what we see in our continent-wide Bouguer gravity anomaly grid is uh, a pattern of uh, high density positive gravity anomalies which are associated with the emplacement of mantle-derived high density rock uh, somewhere within the crust. Typically uh, these are failed continental rifts or as I mentioned before uh, triple junctions also. And we also have large relative negative anomalies. This one is the nine kilometer thick uh, Appalachian sedimentary basin. Uh, here's a, a map for our friends up in Canada. This is the Bouguer gravity anomaly field uh, over Canada. Again, uh, interestingly, we see over the beautiful Canadian Rockies a tremendous negative anomaly, an isostatic negative anomaly due to the extra thick crust, which is needed to support that tremendous topographic relief present. Over the Canadian Shield, we see a pattern similar to what we saw in the eastern United States, a series of positive and negative anomalies associated with lateral density contrast within the Canadian Shield, giving us an indication of um, ancient uh, basement fabric trends, basement faults, and fractures. But let's now look at uh, uh, some more ex exploration-oriented work. This is a commercial uh, gravity marine survey that was conducted in tandem with a 3D seismic acquisition. Uh, we're looking at a Bouguer gravity anomaly map. Again, the uh, effect of the symmetry has been removed. For scale, we're looking at 60 kilometers here. Um, we can see here that uh, we have uh, a uh, broad positive anomaly rimming this area, which is a uh, relative negative anomaly. Within this negative anomaly, we have a series of uh, local sort of elliptical, spherical, uh, negative anomalies. We know this is a salt-prone area. So when we see localized negative anomalies, the first thing that comes to mind is that these guys would be associated with local salt diapirs. The lateral extent of, or the wavelength of the anomaly here gives us an indication of the shape and the size 
and the volume of salt uh, that is present and producing this local negative anomaly. For example, a much uh, lower amplitude, a much broader negative anomaly that we see here relative to this fellow is indicating to me that we've got a much larger volume of salt present here and probably a much deeper keel or a much thicker diaper than what we have over here. All that from just looking at a map. No, no seismic here at all. It's important to recognize again that we can use gravity uh, to help quantify the volume of total salt that we might have within a, within a canopy salt. Ultimately, the goal of looking at gravity data in a salt-prone basin is to hopefully improve the uh, seismic imaging below the base of the canopy salt. We can do this as a 2D approach with using profile modeling, and we can also do this as 3D modeling with a uh, seismic volume, which we can then con convert to a density volume. This is the 3D solution here. And what we've done is we've taken a seismic velocity cube and we've used a relationship to convert our seismic velocities to densities in grams per cubic centimeter. Now that we have our seismic velocity volume converted to density, we can forward model the gravity field of this entire, entire volume. We can then compare that with the observed gravity data and see where the two diverge. Where the two diverge, that's an indication that the seismic velocities may not be correct. And perhaps we can use the gravity to refine or change or alter the volume of salt in these areas to uh, bring the two into concert. Again, then we would take that result back out and reprocess our seismic data, hopefully getting a better answer. Looking at a density volume with cutaways, we can see, for example, um, our salt volumes in here. And ultimately, what we would be looking at would be the inversion of the observed gravity data to refine or develop a gravity-constrained base of salt, which we could then feed back into our seismic processing and hopefully improve our ability to image the uh, sub-salt horizon. Here's what something like that might look like in two dimensions. Uh, this is an example here where we have observed gravity data, shown here as the dots, and our seismic in interpretation in depth. Here we've got a salt canopy, a keel. This is the minimum possible volume of salt that we think we might have in our keel. And here we have our uh, uh, mother salt, if uh, you will, or our, our autochthonous salt. Of course, that is what's feeding the salt canopy up through this keel. Geologically, the uh, question is, where can we put this well? Here we have the same model color-coded as a function of density, so you can better image uh, what's going on in terms of a gravity sense. With this minimum volume of uh, salt in our keel, we probably want to drill the well closer in to the keel itself. This is where our prospects lie, uh, where our, our potential hydrocarbons would be trapped up against the salt. However, what we're worried about is that the keel may not be this thin. What if the keel is, very, is much, much broader? If we uh, drill here and uh, the keel turns out to be much broader, we'll, ne we'll never get out of the salt and we'll miss our target. So, we use gravity to see if we can get a gravity-constrained uh, volume of salt in our keel. In this case, with the minimum volume of salt, our computed gravity response is shown here as the solid line. You see that the gravity model thinks we have more mass than the observed data actually indicate. So this is telling us that, our, uh, that we have too much high-density sediment at the expense of salt. We know that the minimum and minimum salt keel interpretation is not correct. Now, what about the maximum? What about the worst case? What if our keel is super wide? Well, here's the gravity response of the super wide keel. 
you can see now we have a, a theoretical or a model gravity response that is more negative than that of the ob observed data. This is an indication we have too much salt present. So we have to go, now that we've tested the minimum possible volume and the maximum possible volume, we know that we're somewhere in between. So we go with uh, our tried and true Goldilocks method. That's a joke. Um, and uh, we take our, our keel back somewhat. Again, it's not a perfect fit, and it's um, really a proof of concept here. Um, this is an indication that our gravity uh, is telling us that we have a keel that is not as narrow as the minimum case, certainly not as wide as the maximum case, but somewhere in, be, in, be, in between. You may be wondering, can we use the gravity to really get the shape of this keel right? We'll have a better shot at getting the gravity uh, to tell us a little bit more about the exact, or a more exact estimate of what this keel would look like if we begin to look at the gravity gradients, at the rates of change of the gravity field in the vertical sense and in the horizontal sense. So yes, we can get a more detailed image of the shape of, of this keel. A lot of that is driven by the data quality. All right, let's change our gears now and talk a bit about magnetics. Magnetics is a very effective tool for imaging total sediment thickness. It's much less sensitive to things like the uh, total thickness of the crust, so uh, the sediment basement interface becomes a really good target. Another effective use of magnetics is identifying the presence of volcanic rocks within the sedimentary section. High resolution modern aeromagnetics are very effective for imaging shallow faulting along which we have uh, hydrothermal alteration and uh, generation of exotic uh, magnetic mineralogies. As all of you know, iron constitutes a significant volume of Earth's com composite composition. Iron in its most mag 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 magnetic phase, uh, which is magnetite, is uh, present largely in the outer core and in the Earth's crust. And um, this is actually a picture of a meteorite, which is like 98% iron or something like this. So um, this has even, this would have a significant mag magnetic signature without a doubt. It's important when we uh, look at mag magnetics to begin with first principles so we can understand what's going on. The Earth actually has three different mag magnetic fields. The internal or the core field, the external field, which is way out beyond our atmosphere, and the crustal field. The crustal field is what we're interested in for uh, geologic uh, mapping and for uh, hydrocarbon and uh, mineral exp 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 exploration. When we do a magnetic survey, we put a magnetometer typically um, in an aircraft or uh, on a boat, and as the boat or the aircraft traverse across the Earth's surface, we measure the magnetic field. We don't measure only one, we measure all three at the same time. So if we're interested really only in the crustal field for exploration purposes, we've got to understand what these two other fields are so we can get rid of them. So let's have a look at those. The first one is the core field. This by far is the most powerful of all of the three. Um, it is generated by the uh, liquid or molten outer core, uh, which is very iron rich. These are charged particles and uh, motion. Anytime you put a charged particle in motion, what do you get? A magnetic field. So the Earth, of course, is turning, so the magnetic field is always going, and it's a self-sustaining magnet or, or a dynamo. Again, I apologize. I should have a little hand in there. Um, so the, it's, it's the core field that is really the main driver of uh, the two other fields. Let's talk a little bit about the external field. Um, charged particles are emitted from the sun constantly. This is known as the solar wind. These uh, charged particles uh, extend all over the solar system. Some of them come to us, which is very nice. As the charged particles 
are brought in closer to Earth by the Earth's gravitational field. Uh, they begin to have an electromagnetic interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. This gives rise to a highly time variant on the order of minutes, even, uh, mag magnetic field that resides um, outside of uh, our core field lines of force. And this is the external mag magnetic field. The external field, as I, as I mentioned earlier, varies on, um, on the order of minutes, and its strength changes from 0 to 2,000 nanoteslas every day. Um, so it's, uh, again, very time de dependent, and um, uh, it's also impacted not only by the pretty much constant solar wind, but also by solar flares and solar storms. Now, finally, this is the one that we really are interested in. This is called the crustal field. So we have magnetite-rich rocks within um, the Earth's crust, usually uh, obviously within crystalline basin, basement and the sedimentary section. Uh, when magnetite is uh, at a temperature lower than 580 degrees C, known as the Curie point, uh, it will actually give rise to its own internal magnetic field when it's in the presence of what we call an inducing field. So because we have the core magnetic field, thanks to the liquid outer core, that, is, that plays the role of the inducing field. So magnetite in the Earth's crust will have a secondary magnetic field, as its own magnetic field, um, which gives rise to what we call the crustal anomaly field. So we can actually look at the crustal field as a measurement of the uh, lateral Magnetics, uh, um, sorry, <clears throat> metal magnetic susceptibility contrast of rocks within the Earth's crust, within basement and also the sedimentary section. So this is uh, just showing you um, a map of the world, uh, uh, showing uh, positive anomalies in red and negative anomalies in blue uh, of uh, crustal magnetic anomalies. And this is looking at the world uh, from the bottom up. This is the south. Pole, this is the North Pole. So let's summarize again. The core field is our most powerful field with amplitudes 30,000 to 60,000 nanoteslas. The crustal field, uh, only from uh, 0 to 1,000 nanoteslas. Of course, it figures that it's the crustal field that's the one that we're interested in. It's the one with the lowest amplitude, Murphy's Law of Mag magnetic fields. Huh? And then finally, the external field. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the magnetometer measures all three. We're interested only in the crustal field. So we have very robust techniques for, for removing the core field and the external field. We won't be going into those here, but uh, perhaps we can do a uh, follow-on uh, pre present presentation on some more of these uh, details. The crustal magnetic anomaly field is what explorationists are most interested in because it gives us information on basement structure, basement lithology, presence of basalt or volcanics within the sedimentary section, and also magnetization along shallow faults. We'll talk a little bit now about the difference between what we call total magnetic field or in in intensity TMI grid versus the reduced to pole mag magnetic anomaly grids. Uh, these are really important concepts, so bear with me for just a couple of minutes while we talk about the magnetic dipole. We recall that when we uh, talked about gravity anomalies, we mentioned that positive gravity anomalies lie directly over the positive lateral density contrast. Now, for mag magnetic anomalies, it's a, a little bit different. We're looking at a dipole field. Gravity is monopolar, and magnetics is dipolar. So depending upon where the magnetite is in the Earth's crust, within this uh, uh, inducing core field, in other words, what the inclination and the declination in the core field strength happen to be, at that location on Earth, the representation of the magnetic anomaly due to the magnetite in the crust is going to change. Again, this is simply because of the dipolar nature of the 
magnetic field. So what winds up happening is that the uh, total magnetic in intensity anomaly, the TMI anomaly, uh, will not necessarily lie directly over the geologic feature which has the lateral magnetic susceptibility contrast. This can be very complicated and all of you are probably thinking, well TMI, not only is that total magnetic intensity, that's also too much information and you may feel like you're getting a little TMI with this. But uh, bear, bear with me for just a little bit longer <laughs> and we'll struggle through it. Um, all right, here we are looking at a basement fault, or if you will, a horse. Um, this is a simple theoretical model where we've got a magnetic uh, basement, if you will, uh, with a magnetic susceptibility of 1,000 units micro CGS. So we've got a lateral magnetic susceptibility contrast on the south side of the horse as well as on the north side. This is a profile that runs from south to north, again, 0 to 70 kilometers. I beg your pardon, our vertical scale is now from sea level down to 40 kilometers. Our magnetic anomaly amplitude dynamic range is 40 nanoteslas. So let's look at the magnetic anomaly that is caused by this uh, crustal magnetic su susceptibility contrast due to the horse. We're at a, at a geomagnetic in inclination of 45 degrees. This is about the same inclination of, say, Egypt. What we see here is a dipole magnetic anomaly where we have a positive lobe and a negative lobe. And incredibly, the positive lobe of the dipole anomaly is located to the south of the horse itself. And there's a negative lobe of the dipole anomaly located to the north of the horse. When I look at this in map form, I'm going to be very confused because what, we, what I'm going to see is a positive mag, magnetic anomaly and a negative. And if I miss the fact that they're a dipole pair, I'm going to misinterpret the location of my horse. Wouldn't it be nice if I could somehow phase shift my TMI, total magnetic intensity, too much information, magnetic anomaly here, so that it were a body center magnetic anomaly just like the gravity case. This is called a reduction to pole uh, phase shift or filter. And this is, believe it or not, the same horse that we had in Egypt, but now it's up at the geomagnetic north pole. And when we put it up at the geomagnetic north pole, look what happens to my anomaly perfectly body center. It looks like gravity. And incredibly, when I look at the steepest portion of the magnetic anomaly curve here, where, where is it located? Directly over the edges of my uh, anomalous uh, magnetic susceptibility. Again, I have a magnetic anomaly because I have a lateral magnetic susceptibility contrast. So always we want to do what's called a reduction to pole, a phase shift to pole. Here's the magnetic anomaly at 45 degrees, and here it is at 90. What does this look like in map form? Here is a uh, theoretical horse block if, uh, uh, if uh, well, actually, in this case, this was not a horse block. This was all um, the uh, same depth everywhere, but I had more iron-rich rock over in this purple uh, square here. So within the purple square, I have more uh, iron, iron-rich iron rock. So I have less iron-rich rock around it and more iron-rich rock within my purple block. Again, at 45 degrees, when I have this in Egypt, I have a, a positive magnetic dipole on the south side of the anomaly, a negative mag magnetic dipole on the north side. I'm not happy with that because if I forget that it's a TMI anomaly, and I'm at 45 degrees north, I will perhaps mis mismap or misinterpret the location of the iron-rich basement to be farther south than it actually is. To be on the safe side, what I'm going to do is perform a reduction to pole filter, an RTP filter, and now, of course, I have a perfectly body-centered positive anomaly, just like the gravity case. Makes me much happier. All right, now part of the reason why magnetics is really effective in mapping total sediment thickness is that the magnetics 
typical magnetic susceptibilities of uh, rocks we tend to find in basement, like metamorphic and igneous rocks, are much more magnetic, have a much higher magnetic susceptibility than sedimentary rocks. Uh, this is again from Dobrin and Savitt. We see that the sedimentary rocks are typically lower than 100 and even often much closer to zero in terms of their magnetic susceptibilities. The igneous and metamorphic rocks are in the hundreds and more, more often in the thousands. So this dramatic magnetic susceptibility contrast makes it really easy to image where the sediments stop and the uh, basement begins. Now let's have a look at uh, a nice example here where we're looking at the possible uh, uh, the possibility of having volcanics within the sedimentary section. Seismically, of course, if we have volcanics in the sedimentary section, we often get a bright spot in terms of the acoustical uh, uh, properties of the uh, of the feature. So that can look like hydrocarbon as well. Mag magnetics are extremely diagnostic for being able to tell the difference between whether the bright spot is hydrocarbon, which has a magnetic susceptibility of practically nothing, or vo vo volcanics, which will have a magnetic susceptibility in the thousands. Here's an Earth model that we've built. Uh, the observed marine magnetic anomaly is shown as dots, and the calculated magnetic response of our model is shown as a solid line. We do have a well in the area. We know that this well has encountered vo volcanics, uh, a total uh, thickness of 250 meters of them at this depth. So the question is now, um, can uh, some of these other relatively uh, bright spot uh, anomalies observed in the, the seismic data, could these possibly be uh, volcanics? So our model is shown here. And again, uh, we're using the seismic data to help us identify the areas where we think that we might have bright spot anomalies. And we're trying to tell the difference between whether they might be uh, hydrocarbon or uh, volcanics. So as we change our model around and we add more uh, volcanics to our model, we can see that the initial model, which had a minimum possible volume of volcanic rocks within the sedimentary section really doesn't seem to fit at all. So when we go ahead and add in our uh, uh, volcanics, we're able to get a much better fit. And um, the optimistic news here is that at least for a part of our area, it does seem like the seismic bright spot could possibly be a lead or a prospect, although certainly we recognize that this is not uh, an area that's com completely devoid of igneous material within the sedimentary section. Part of what is really helpful here is as we look at the magnetic character in here, we see some very broad uh, positive and negative magnetic anomalies. And much of this is coming from deep within the basement. However, superimposed on that, we have a lot of short wavelength uh, mag magnetic anomalies. And these are the features that we're most concerned about as being sourced by intra-sedimentary volcanic rocks. So again, there's the initial model without much intra-sedimentary volcanic rocks. And here is our uh, second model. Now let's back out and look at sort of a, a larger scale. Can we use magnetics to help us map the continental oceanic crustal boundary, otherwise known as the COB? as we venture out into more challenging uh, hydrocarbon systems, we're going closer and closer toward the oceanic crustal boundary. And, it's, uh, and magnetics can be a great way in certain parts of the world for us to map those. Looking at the uh, public domain crustal magnetic anomaly field here, uh, we see uh, a very uh, dramatic pronounced pattern of very linear uh, positive and negative magnetic anomalies. Again, this is TMI data. This has not been reduced to pole. There's a big change, though, as you can see 
where I've mapped in uh, black here the uh, boundary of this uh, domain, if you will, of linear magnetic anomalies versus this more blobby chaotic zone as we go farther to the east. The client was really interested in this because the approximate location of their concession is right here. It looks to us that the linear magnetic anomalies that we see on the west side are associated with well-behaved typical oceanic crust plus minus magnetic seafloor striping anomalies. So as new crust, of course, is created in, uh, in the world's oceans, we see remnant magnetization in the opposite sense, and that's what gives rise to the plus minus trend. Now, uh, what's of uh, key interest also to the client is that there appear to be some uh, transforms or fractures that are cutting through this oceanic crust here. Some of these transforms and fractures line up extremely well with local anomalies within their con concession. What they're worried about is that some of these transforms or faults may uh, con continue or at least uh, uh, jostle some of this transitional or continental crust that we see uh, east, east of, of, of my uh, in interpreted COB boundary. So if these transforms are uh, still active or still exerting some type of stress or fracturing or faulting well into the transitional or or, or continental crust on the eastern side, there's a, there's a strong possibility that we could have some magma, leakage, volcanism, something like this going on on the eastern side of this boundary here. Now when we look at the that, that, at the bathymetric data, we see that our, our boundary here between oceanic crust and transitional slash continental crust um, is uh, following this uh, continental, uh, this base of the continental slope very, very well in the southern part of the area of interest. As we go farther to the north, however, we see that the continental that the base of the continental slope takes off in a due north d direction. And we would not necessarily uh, be able to interpret the uh, COB properly if we were just trying to map it directly off of uh, the base of the continental slope. So this is a great example where it's really important that you have a look at all of the data sets that uh, you have access to, not just bathymetry and not even just gravity looking at gravity and bathymetry and the magnets together will give you a better answer. Uh, and just for com completeness sake, we're now looking at the Bouguer gravity anomaly, uh, again, public domain data. And we can see again that the Bouguer gravity is uh, following much more closely the bathymetric data than it is the magnetic data. So uh, in this case, this is a clear indication that the magnetic anomaly uh, that is helping us to outline the COB more accurately than either the bathymetry or the Bouguer gravity. And just out of, uh, again, that's how you properly spell Bouguer gravity. All right. Um, one thing I want to make you all aware of is that we do have global bathymetry, gravity, and magnetic data sets in the public domain. These are wonderful regional exploration tools, and you should download them right away. As a matter of fact, through the Geosoft DAP server, or DAC server, you can access these uh, data sets for free for your area of uh, interest. It's uh, very, very fast, and the uh, and, uh, uh, download is simple and direct. Here is the global pre predicted bathymetric data. Uh, these are, at, again, um, in the public domain, and they've been published by Sandwell and Smith. There are other solutions as as well, notably uh, the Danish National uh, Space Agency. All right, um, we move on to the global marine free air gravity. Again, uh, in terms of that bathymetric uh, correlation, we should see a very uh, a very strong one here. Uh, again, these are published by Sandwell and Smith, and um, I would certainly point you to the uh, Danish source also. And finally, uh, this is 
Winterman's com computed uh, global marine bouquet gravity solution to derive from the two previous uh, data sets that uh, we showed you. So again, these are from Sandwell and Smith, and we at Wintermoon have done our own Bouguet correction on them. And then finally, the global crustal total magnetic intensity, or TMI grid. And again, we see our beautiful uh, oceanic crust, seafloor spreading anomalies in the northern Pacific and the northern At Atlantic, and also in parts of the Indian Ocean very, very nicely. Of course, when you begin to look at the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico and some areas in Southeast Asia, the uh, nice magnetic striping tends to be highly obscured by far more complicated te tectonic pro uh, pr uh, processes. So uh, things begin to break down there. But boy, this stuff is gorgeous up here, that's for sure. All right, so let's go and look at some more case, case histories. Um, we'll look at the, and it, uh, some 2D uh, gravity and magnetic profiles in areas where we have thrusting. This is a case where we've got uh, thrusting on the west and thrusting on the east. Here's the seismic data. What do you think of the seismic data quality? Yuck. Not that great. Um, big problem here. What is the, uh, how much thrusting do we actually have? Is the basement involved in it? And how much sediment do we have? Uh, wrapped up under that thrust. Uh, of course, uh, if this is an area that we'd like to ex explore, the angle of this thrust and the total uh, uh, volume or the geometry of this um, thrust sheet becomes very, very important. Seismic data quality, again, somewhat marginal. So let's color code this as a function of density. And now you can see our high density basement in red. And we are getting um, a nice looking shape for this uh, uh, over thrusted sheet over here. So this is very basement involved thrust. And we have a little pop-up block in here. The um, observed gravity shown as the dots in the middle panel. And the observed magnetic shown as the dots in the upper panel. This is RTP. This is reduced to pole magnetics. Um, and uh, our calculated magnetic response, our calculated gravity response shown here. So let's color code the uh, model now as a function of magnetic susceptibility. And we see that we have um, a uh, basement of different magnetic susceptibility, uh, which is part of this thrust sheet over here relative to these other basement blocks here. Now um, let's look at uh, another model, which is now 25 kilometers south of the previous model. The gravity uh, cartoon is shown on, uh, um, on the upper panel, and the magnetic susceptibility model is shown on the lower panel. Uh, now you can see that the shape of the thrust has changed quite a bit. So we've gone from something which is looking um, more like this in the north to uh, a more vertical thrust, as you can see now in the south. Again, gravity and mag are extremely helpful, especially the mag, for helping us image the angle of this thrust sheet. All right, let's look now at how gravity can help us with modeling total sediment thickness. Uh, in this case, we have uh, an Earth model from 0 to 18 kilometers here. And we're going from 0 to 100 kilometers across our model. Our observed data, shown as dots, and our calculated uh, response shown here as the solid line. In this case, we are assuming that we have a sediment fill of relatively constant uh, density everywhere. And uh, we're just interested here in looking at the lateral density contrast between the sedimentary rocks and the basement rocks. Again, assuming that the basement is all the same density everywhere, the only uh, gravity anomaly that we've got is going to come from the lateral density contrast between the sedimentary rocks and the basement. In this case, we have a density contrast of 0 0.13 grams per cubic centimeter. So in our observed data, if we've got a 30 milligal gravity anomaly 
And if we have, again, uniform density sediments and uniform density basement, then we know that we've got a tremendously thick uh, sedimentary column here, down to uh, seven uh, kilometers. Now, we can use a gravity uh, survey to actually help us invert for um, total uh, sediment thickness, too. In this case, this was a forward model. We could actually run this backwards, where we look at the ob observed data and try to calculate what the shape actually is of this uh, basement interface. I'll, I'll show you an example now for a mining client who was interested in looking at their gravity anomaly field and figuring out how much overburden they would have to drill through in order to get to their mining targets. So we use the, the gravity field to um, invert uh, to find a basement relief or a basement depth surface. We could then calculate, of course, the isopack of uh, sediments by uh, simply subtracting the digital terrain model from the, uh, from the derived basement uh, surface. Again, the one thing that we have to know here is what? The lateral density contrast between the sediment and the basement. We know this because we have uh, a guy out there collecting all of these uh, gravity uh, readings at all of these in individual dots, and while he's out there, he's collecting um, rock. He's collecting rock samples so we can test the density of the uh, sedimentary rocks. In addition, we also know that we have out outcrops in the area, so he was able to sample the uh, rocks from the uh, basement um, outcrop, and then we had a laboratory derived density contrast between sediment and basement. Knowing that, uh, again, uh, going backwards for just a sec, we'll look at the digital ele elevation model. We see just like the gravity, we have um, uh, a relative high, a topographic high, and a gravity high in the north, and a topographic low, and a gravity low. Uh, sorry, in, in the south we have a high, and in the north we have a low. So uh, now, uh, knowing where we have our outcrops, knowing the lateral density contrast that we can expect from the sedimentary rocks uh, versus the basement rocks, thanks to our field samples, we can actually calculate the bedrock relief surface by inverting the, uh, the uh, 3D the 3D gravity. And what we're seeing is that the uh, bedrock surface does not exactly mimic the uh, topography. So of course, when it comes time to, for us to calculate the isopack, we can see that we have relative thick uh, sedimentary sections in these areas over here and over in this area over in here. So if, if, if a mining comp company would like to drill in, um, uh, down to bedrock for mining purposes in the areas which have the least amount of overburden, we have a gravity-derived isopack that will help guide their exploration effort and that will, of course, help them uh, to minimize their finding costs. Okay, there's a couple of other topics that we'd uh, like to cover in the, in, the, in the 10 minutes that we have left. I mentioned out at the outset that gravity and magnetic data image lateral density and magnetic susceptibility contrast through the entire crust. So what we want, wind up with often is um, a very complicated uh, gravity or magnetic anomaly grid, which is imaging long wavelength anomalies, which are sourced from uh, very deep-seated crustal uh, te tectonic processes, and then relatively short wavelength gravity and magnetic anomalies, which are uh, sourced from shallower work. Uh, more uh, exploration-oriented uh, geologic sources. So there's a, there are techniques that we use to help filter the gravity and magnetic data, which enable us to focus on the signal that we're interested in. If we're doing exploration, most of the time we're more interested in looking at, a, um, uh, at the signatures that are coming from the shallow part of the crust, not from the base of the crust. 
So um, what we'll spend some time now talking about is how we do what we call regional versus re residual separation. Uh, what I like to say is one person single is another person joint. So if you're um, more academic, you might be more interested in what's going on in the lower part of the crust. And if you're more uh, ex exploration oriented, maybe you're more interested in what's going on usually in the shallow part of the crust. Um, so two primary goals of the filtering techniques that we'll be talking about, regional versus uh, residual separation, basement versus sedimentary gravity signatures. This helps us to isolate salt and shell that we might want to look at. You've heard, I'm sure, of um, uh, wavelength filtering. These are band pass, low pass, and high pass. Um, in some cases, these can give you some results which are a little bit tough to uh, in interpret, so you do have to exercise a little caution. Uh, we also have swing tail or Wiener filters, um, upward con continuation res residual filters. These are my favorite currently. Um, and then polynomial surface filtering. The other primary goal of filtering is to identify the edges of the geologic sources of the gravity or the, or the reducible magnetic anomaly. So we call this edge en enhancement. And typical techniques that we use here are directional derivatives, vertical derivatives, tail derivatives, analytical signal, and horizontal derivatives or maximum horizontal gradient filters. So here's an example of some regional residual separation. Here's the uh, total field Bouguer gravity anomaly grid for uh, the southern Greenland and eastern Canada area. So you see we have um, positive anomalies in red and negative anomalies in green and blue. Uh, interestingly, as we look at um, the uh, regional component of these anomalies, uh, you can see that uh, the, a lot of the detail that we have in the total field winds up being smoothed through. When we look at the res residual, however, we see that um, whereas all of this area is lo looking like a strong positive anomaly, when we look at the residual here, we can see still a lot of the same character, but We've um, been able to take away some of that um, overwhelming red positive uh, signal that was sort of masking a bit of the uh, detail, which we can now see very easily here. A, a really important thing to keep in mind is when we are thinking about um, filtering data, we want to uh, not introduce any spatial artifacts. Anything that we're seeing in our filtered data, we should be able to go back to the original grid and find evidence for uh, the features that we're seeing here that we might want to in interpret as uh, being bona fide anomalies in our input grid. So this hopefully is a little bit easier for you to look at than uh, this grid over here. <coughs> Pardon me. So now uh, we'll look at a couple of high pass maps. And we can see here uh, that uh, as we get to shorter and shorter wavelengths on our high pass maps, this is a 100 kilometer high pass and a 50 kilometer high pass, we've begun to get into the, uh, if you will, wormy spaghetti look rather than the uh, geologic look. This is the uh, upward continuation residual and this is the uh, 50 kilometer high pass. I trust this map a lot more than I trust this and that here I can look at these anomalies and still find them over in the input grid. I'm not sure that I can do the same with this 50 kilometer high pass map. So here's an example of how removing the regional signal will help us to image uh, some of the target, for example, salt diapers that we're interested in. Uh, this is a commercial quality land, uh, land gravity uh, survey in a salt prone area. Uh, we have one milligal contours posted and our horizontal scale is shown here. We see a lot of local negative anomalies in here, and we think these guys are probably associated with salt. Well, truth be told, there's a lot more in terms of local negative anomalies. Let's have a look at our uh, residual gravity anomaly. All of these areas which are shown by these uh, black arrows are a lot easier to identify in our residual gravity anomaly grid than they were in the original. Here's the original, here's the uh, residual. So again, the purpose of doing this regional 
these visual separation is to help our eyes see signal that's present in the total field, but hard for us to, but hard for our eyes to recognize because there's a lot more long wavelength signal that's ob obscuring it. Um, okay, and uh, we're going to hop over this because we're beginning to get a little short on time, and we'll just jump right over to um, highlighting edges. Uh, the uh, two most popular tools uh, that we use are both directional derivative filters and the vertical derivative uh, filters. Uh, colleagues also like to use the uh, horizontal or uh, horizontal derivative or the maximum gradient also. Uh, coming on uh, with more popularity these days are the filter derivative and the analytic signal. Um, a, a directional derivative is really nothing more than a sun illuminated or a color draped map. On the left hand side you see an RTP mag magnetic anomaly grid. Uh, this is just a conventional color filled grid. In this map we see all kinds of colors and it looks rather uh, rather blobby. When we illuminate this from the northwest we see all of a sudden a tremendous amount of uh, linear features, fractures, faults, basement uh, Basement dis, basement discontinuities, zones where we're clearly looking at lateral magnetic susceptibility contrast within the uh, basement. Now, these areas here um, uh, are much easier to recognize in our uh, directional derivative grid than they are in our simple color-filled image. Always, when you're working with magnetic data, if you do a directional derivative, you should do it on the RTP. And when we think back to the dipole problem, you'll uh, begin to see why I'm really em emphatic about that. I, sh I, sh I should point out, too, anytime you're doing any regional re residual separation on mag magnetic anomaly maps, always make sure, again, to operate on the RTP grids, for sure. Um, and now uh, our last example here is just showing, uh, in, in this case, a theoretical gravity anomaly. Uh, we see the outline of the, pardon me, of the uh, uh, lateral density contrast here in green. So we have a body-centered positive gravity anomaly uh, around our uh, positive uh, lateral density contrast grid. When we calculate the first vertical derivative of the gravity map, we get uh, this map over here, and the zero contour shown here as a black outline is um, nearly identical with the edge of our uh, theoretical uh, location of the lateral density contrast. So uh, it's quite nice when you do the first vertical derivative, if you simply map the zero contour of that, you'll get the approximate outline of the edge of the, uh, of the, of the geologic source of the gravity or the, mag or the RTP magnetic anomaly. Um, and, and then similarly, if we go ahead and look at the maximum horizontal gradient of the gravity uh, anomaly, we get a positive uh, uh, in the maximum horizontal gradient directly over the edges of our uh, geologic source of the gravity anomaly. And what this looks like in profile is shown over here, where we have our uh, input anomaly, either the RTP or the gravity shown in red, um, and uh, the, the first vertical uh, derivative of that is shown in blue, and that zero contour or the zero crossing uh, happens to correspond exactly with the edges of the source of the anomaly. Uh, al alternatively, uh, if you would prefer to look at positives right over the edges of the uh, source of the uh, anomaly, you can look at the maximum horizontal gradient, which is shown here in green. So we have the positives directly over the edges of the source, or if you would prefer to look at the zero contour, um, you can look at the first vertical derivative. And here's an example of this. We're looking at RTP at, at a high resolution, uh, RTP aeromagnetic aer 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 anomaly grid over here, where we have strong uh, long wavelength, high amplitude po uh, positive anomalies, which are sourced 
within the basement and then superimposed on those we have uh, magnetite rich uh, sand channels which are only in the uppermost couple of hundred meters. So we have sedimentary magnetic anomalies again due to magnetite in sand channels here um, and it sort of looks like a bunch of uh, worm patterns or you know crawling patterns through this um, anomaly mapping here. Um, superimposed on these basement uh, source high amplitude mag magnetic anomalies. When I calculate the first vertical derivative, which is shown over here on the right hand side, you see that this now highlights extremely nicely for us the edges of all of the sedimentary anomalies. Again, all of these magnetite rich sand channels really pop out very, very nicely. If I were to draw the zero contour here, it would lie uh, between the, um, the purple red and the blue. So it would be a very nice sharp looking edge and that would very uh, accurately outline the locations of these magnetite rich sand channels. Again that's evident here too but if the first vertical derivative makes it easier for you to map it then by all means filter away. Okay. Um, what we've learned today is that gravity and mag are important geophysical tools for imaging regions where we have lateral contrast in either density and or magnetic susceptibility. If we have layer cake, geology, gravity and mag won't give you any anomaly. And that is not a terrible thing anyway because you probably won't find any hydrocarbon in perfect layer cake uh, ge geology anyway. Uh, one of our challenges is that potential fields sense these uh, lateral contrasts within the complete crustal column to aid us in looking at potential field anomalies of exploration interest we apply filtering to help uh, to identify the uh, signal of highest interest for us. Very importantly we can build crustal models of uh, density and magnetic susceptibility which help us to constrain our geologic un understanding and ultimately to improve our um, seismic data quality. As a result this lowers our exploration risk. So I want to thank you uh, for joining us uh, to today and uh, for those of you who still have time and interest uh, I, I would be very happy to field any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Okay, you should all be unmuted now. So if anyone does have questions, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. This is Adriana Mantilla from Repsol Madrid. Hi, Adriana. I have a question. Yeah, hello. I have a question regarding to the to the um, resolution of the gravity data. What 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 resolution of gravity data do do we have to perform 3D inversion for sediment thickness? Uh, thank you. That is a really excellent question. Uh, Adriana, as you can imagine, um, with respect to resolution for both gravity and for mag, we, we get what we pay for. Um, typically with uh, gravity data, uh, if we're going to um, do some in inversion for sediment thickness, we would probably not want to use only the public domain data. The public yeah. domain data uh, just does not have the spatial uh, resolution or the uh, accuracy to give us a good estimate. Uh, if we can afford to survey an area in de detail, like for example, if we have a, uh, a ship going out to collect 3D gravity data and, uh, uh, sorry, 3D seismic data and we can piggyback uh, a gravity meter on the ship, the data quality is excellent. Uh, the line spacing is very, very close. Um, so I think uh, uh, in terms of resolution of total sediment thickness off of a 3D um, survey, uh, we're looking at very, very good accuracies provided we have some insight into the uh, density contrast between uh, the total sediment column uh, and the underlying basement. Uh, in that case history that I showed you, that was a nice easy example because we had basements out, outcrop in certain areas and then we also had uh, 
sedimentary rocks there too, and we had somebody out in the field who could actually collect them, and then we could do laboratory measurements. A big question that we often have, Adriana, with regard to uh, in inverting for total sediment thickness is what is the average density of the sediment column? If you have some confidence in that, I think we can get that right. Um, again, I would probably do a, uh, a joint in inversion of gravity and mag in that case. Mag is uh, in some ways a more uh, reliable tool because the magnetic susceptibility of the uh, sediments is so low compared to that of pretty much any kind of basement. The problem there is that um, magnetic basement may not be the same as acoustic basement. So we can sometimes get into uh, trouble. So the long, that's the long answer. The short answer is that um, uh, your uh, confidence in your total sediment thickness in, based on the gravity the magnetic version is based on what you already know about what type of density contrast or magnetic susceptibility contrast you might actually have. If you have a good idea about that, you should be able to get it down within 500 meters without any problem. Good. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions for Michael? No? Well, thank you. If, if you do have any further questions, please feel free to contact us and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Again, on behalf of Geosoft and Macau, uh, we thank you for your time today.